So in this second part of the podcast on hematological malignancies, I'm going to talk a little bit about lymphoma and myeloma. So firstly, lymphoma. Before I go on to talk about it, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, some, of the, some of the physiological features of the lymphatic system, um, particularly um, lymph node structure. So um, lymph nodes coming from the outside in have a collagenous capsule, a cortex, a paracortex, and a medulla. The cortex contains lymphoid follicles and the B-cell zone. The paracortex is a T-cell zone, and the medulla is where the cords and sinuses come together to form the efferent um, lymphatic system that, that leaves the nodes. From a physiological point of view, it's important to know that the lymph, or the afferent lymph, comes from the outside of the capsule and leaves through this medulla area where also arteries and veins are coming in. The last important thing to know about is the germinal centers, which are the structures where white cells are exposed and, and primed with antigens. So now a little bit of, of basic pathology. Most lymph node enlargements are benign and have many causes, the most important of which are probably infection, which can be really very, very mild. Um, for example, an inguinal lymphadenopathy can result simply from a small scratch on the leg. Other important causes are um, AIDS-related diseases, and HIV itself, which may even present with lymphadenopathy, and various other um, lymphadenitis um, diseases. So we can really divide up lymphadenitis into acute non-specific lymphadenitis with enlarged nodes with prominent germinal centers, usually caused um, by infection and the reactive and inflammatory changes that result from this. Or they can be chronic non-specific lymphadenitis. Now this can be divided into follicular hyperplasia, due to prominent B cell activation, the most common cause of which is HIV, um, and paracortical hyperplasia with reactive changes in the T zone. Most important causes of this are viral infections. The last type is granulomatous lymphadenitis, for example, with tuberculosis. So now we're going to go on to consider specifically malignancies of the lymphoid system, or lymphoma. So lymphoma um, typically presents as discrete tumor masses, either in the lymph nodes or in various extranodal locations. And there are two basic categories, Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which respectively account for 20% and 80% of these neoplasms. I'm going to start by talking about non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, non-Hodgkin lymphoma has quite a complicated subclassification, and the easiest way to remember and think about it is by considering normal B cell, uh, normal B lymphocyte development. So what happens is a, a naive B cell from the bone marrow may encounter an antigen, at which point it migrates to the lymphoid follicle. The lymphoid follicles are composed of three layers, the marginal zone, the mantle zone, and the germinal center. So it's been exposed to its antigen, it then moves into the mantle zone where it becomes a mantle cell, then into the germinal center where it becomes a large centroblast. Still in the, in the germinal center, it then turns into a more quiescent centrocyte. And following this, it forms a marginal zone B cell in the marginal zone and lastly forms a plasma cell. Now, malignant change is quite common in this situation as there's quite a lot of somatic hypermutation and genetic instability. And each of these cells can become malignant. Um, so if a naive B lymphocyte becomes malignant, it, small, it forms a small lymphocytic lymphoma. Mantle cells form mantle cell lymphomas. Centroblasts, because they're large, cause diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Centrocytes fall uh, for follicular lymphoma. Marginal zone B cells for marginal zone lymphoma. And plasma cells, obviously, is myeloma, which we're going to talk about later. T cell non Hodgkin lymphoma is quite rare, but is very aggressive. And the two most important examples are cutaneous T cell lymphoma, or mycosis fungoides, and enteropathy associated lymphoma that is more common in uh, gluten sensitivity enteropathy. So we've covered all the different types of lymphoma. We can now divide them up into those that are high-grade and aggressive and those that are low-grade and indolent. Um, and there are kind of three important 
lymphomas in each of these categories. So the aggressive ones tend to be Burkitt's lymphoma, which we know is associated with EBV, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, if you remember those are the lymphomas that come from the central blasts in the germinal center, and also mantle cell lymphomas, which are the lymphomas that come from mantle cells from the mantle zone. The lower grade or indolent ones are all the, all the other ones, so the small lymphocytic lymphoma, the follicular lymphoma, and the marginal zone lymphoma. Interestingly, there is a paradox between aggressive and indolent lymphomas in that the more aggressive the tumour is, the more curable it often is as well. And this also is why indolent lymphoma is largely incurable. Presentations of lymphoma um, are constitutional symptoms such as fever, weight loss, night sweats, as well as painful lymphadenopathy. However, non-Hodgkin lymphomas have the tendency to present at um, extranodal sites, the most common of which are the CNS, the skin, and the GI tract. Management principles are quite complicated, but um, basically in aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there is intensive chemotherapy with the aim of curing the condition, while in more indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it is often more appropriate to adopt a watch-and-wait strategy. The one exception to this is gastric mucosa-associated non-Hodgkin lymphoma, usually due to chronic antigen stimulation such as in Sjogren's syndrome or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is treated with proton pump inhibitors and antibiotics. So these patients are typically given omeprazole, clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. So next I'm going to talk about Hodgkin lymphoma, which accounts for 20% of the lymphomas. Hodgkin lymphoma is broadly classified into two types, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma and nodular lymphocytic Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma is by far the most important category, accounting for 95% of Hodgkin lymphoma, while the nodular type accounts for around 5%. There are four subcategories of classical Hodgkin's lymphoma that are based upon the appearance of non-neoplastic inflammatory infiltrate cells that tend to appear around neoplastic lymphocytes. So these are nodular sclerosing, which tends to present in younger people with mediastinum involvement greater than peripheral involvement, mixed cellularity, which tends to um, pre present in older people, with peripheral involvement more than mediastinal involvement, and then two very rare types, um, lymphocyte rise and lymphocytes depleted, which really are not very important. The other category, nodular lymphocytic, tends to occur in older individuals and most commonly uh, is with um, inguinal node involvement. The pathognomonic feature of, of Hodgkin's lymphoma is the Reed-Sternberg cell, which is a large binucleate cell often set in the background of other inflammatory cells with an owl's eye appearance. Presentation is bimodal, either in young people or in elderly people, and presentation is with constitutional symptoms such as fever, night sweats, weight loss, puritis, and this phenomenon of alcohol-induced pain, which is rare but classical for Hodgkin's lymphoma. The other presentation obviously is with painless enlargement of lymph nodes, most commonly in the neck, plus mediastinal symptoms such as cough, SVC obstruction or dysphagia. First line investigation is a lymph node biopsy to determine if this is Hodgkin's lymphoma. And next there is staging with CT scans, bone marrow biopsies, other biopsies if other organs are suspected to be involved and this really determines the prognosis. Management once again is com complex, surgery is not useful and the aim is to balance the, the benefits from a, a cure which is achievable in around 80% and that danger of developing secondary malignancies with lots of chemo and radiotherapy. So that's complete really what I wanted to say about the, um, the lymphomas. Now I'm going to go on to talk about multiple myeloma, which is a hematological malignancy of plasma cells. The important features of multiple myeloma are the production of monoclonal immunoglobulin, 
which is termed paraprotein, or IgG M protein, a reduction in normal polyclonal immunoglobulins that has important consequences, and often, but not always, production by these abnormal plasma cells of free light chains, resulting in the presence of Bentz-Jones protein in the urine. The most important sites that abnormal plasma cells seed are the bone marrow, vertebra, ribs, and skull. In terms of the epidemiology, multiple myeloma typically presents in people older than 60 years and has a number of characteristic clinical features. Bone pain, which is a very important feature, is caused by excessive stimulation of osteoclasts by plasma cells and results in lytic lesions on the x-ray, generalized osteoporosis, and therefore fractures, typically in the vertebrae leading to back pain. Because of this excess breakdown of bone, there is usually a hypercalcemia, resulting in all of the characteristic features of this. There may also be bone marrow infiltration, with anemia being the most common feature, and this is a normocytic, normochromic anemia. Infections are common due to immune paresis, and renal failure is also a considerable, considerable problem for a number of reasons. In the 30% of patients with myeloma that have Bentz-Jones protein in their urine, this has, these proteins have a tendency to form solid casts in the distal nephrons, which may disrupt the normal mechanism of the kidney. In addition to this, a group of, subgroup of patients will also develop light chain amyloidosis, which can be deposited in the kidneys and lead to a nephrotic syndrome with quite a lot of proteinuria. All of these things are also exacerbated by the presence of hyperkalemia and chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. On the blood panel, there is usually a raised ESR, and this is because M protein often coats red blood cells, causing them to clump and form rouleau. And obviously there is an abnormal electrophoresis with a single monoclonal band of paraprotein. An important differential of myeloma is the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which is where there is paraprotein in uh, the blood or, or, and no underlying multiple myeloma or other lymphoproliferative condition. Treatment is largely symptomatic, so for renal failure, a high fluid intake is, in, is encouraged with correction of dehydration, hypercalcemia, rehydration is important, and bisphosphonates can be taken. For bone lesions, lo local radiotherapy, uh, long-term oral bisphosphonates can also help, and for anemia, EPO and transfusions. Specific therapy can aim to slow the progression of the disease, and classical therapy involves melphalan and prednisolone, or the VAD regime. For younger patients, bone marrow transplantation is also an option. So that completes this third podcast on the hematological malignancies.